Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, Palm Sunday is a well-known day in the church year. Everyone recalls the scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey with all of those crowds waving their palm branches and singing His praises. It was a day of great joy. Today's Gospel, though, is from... Palm Sunday as well, where we remember not the joy, but our Lord's tears. The tears of Jerusalem's King for His beloved city as He foresaw its eventual destruction because of their unbelief. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You know, it's easy with today's Gospel lesson to get lost in all of the history, history that is quite foreign to 21st century Americans. But that does not mean it's irrelevant. This is God's word. This is God's warning, not just to Israel, but to all. Backing up under King Saul, and then under King David, and then King Solomon, Israel was united. The tribes were united. However, with the reign of Rehoboam, that being the son of Solomon, the nation of Israel was split into two kingdoms. You had the kingdom of Israel, this is where it gets a little confusing for us, but the kingdom of Israel was in the north, the ten tribes in the north, and then you had the kingdom of Judah down in the south, two of them. And your Bible records how idolatry and rebellion took over and how God sent prophets to both kingdoms. In the north, in the north you had prophets like Elijah, Elisha, Amos, Joel, Hosea, prophets who warned those living in the northern kingdom who were in rank heresy and unbelief to essentially, let's just boil it down, turn or burn. Turn from their wicked ways or experience the wrath of God. Now, gratefully, some listened. They listened to the prophets, they repented, and that small group is called a remnant. The Lord never leaves Himself without a remnant. And there was a remnant in the northern kingdom. However, most did not listen. They persisted in their unbelief and other, as we would say, other great shame and vice. And as a result, God called like you calling your dog in from outside. God called the Assyrians to wipe out that kingdom of Israel in the north. The year was 721 B.C. Now, this served as a very striking and vivid lesson for those who were living in the southern kingdom. I mean, you don't want to wind up like them, do you? So what do we do? We repent. That was the message. You don't want to wind up like them. Don't do like them. Repent. Did they do that? They didn't. They didn't. They ignored it altogether. And so what God did in His mercy was send them prophets. Prophets like Obadiah and Joel and Micah and Isaiah and another prophet whom we've already heard from this morning, the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah stood in the gates of the temple in Jerusalem, that being the southern kingdom, and he warns them to amend their ways or they would have to face what was coming for them. Jeremiah even says, he says, look, even the stork in the heavens knows her times 
and the turtle dove and the swallow and the crane keep the time of their coming, but my people know not the rules of the Lord. What's Jeremiah saying? He's saying the animal life, the animal kingdom, the aviary, the birds are smarter than y'all. And boy, they hated Jeremiah for telling them that what they were doing was wrong. And so within Jeremiah's own lifetime, the southern kingdom of Judah, just like the northern kingdom of Israel, was practically obliterated by, this time, the Babylonians. The temple where Jeremiah stood and warned them, it too was wiped out, just as, the, just as God said. Why? Because they didn't want God. They didn't want anything to do with Him. Their own stubbornness and their own sinful desires kept them from repentance. And the year was 586 B.C. Now, gratefully, due to the warnings of Jeremiah and other prophets to the southern kingdom, a handful of people known as a remnant, a remnant were brought to repentance. And after being exiled to Babylon for 70 years, they returned, and they returned back to the southern kingdom. And this is where they rebuilt the walls of, the, of Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple, and they waited for the Christ. It was, a, it was a, 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 a poor, poor, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, uh, rebuilding process compared to what it looked like before. But it was there nonetheless. They waited for the Christ. They waited for the Messiah to come. And then praise be to God, He did. He showed up. All of Jerusalem's history had been leading up to the arrival of God's own Son in the flesh. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, as we just confessed. This was God's Messiah, the King of Kings, riding in with salvation, who rides into Jerusalem on the donkey and the shouts of Hosanna, which means, save us! Save us now. The religious leaders were quick to tell King Jesus to rebuke the people, claiming Him to be Messiah. Do you not hear what they're saying about you? You've got to tell your people to pipe down. But as you know, He wouldn't do that. For they had it right. And on the heels of this, still mounted on the donkey, within the walls of the city of peace, King Jesus weeps. Here is the arrival of the promised Savior, which was supposed to be Jerusalem's hour of glory, not just with a handful of citizens recognizing Jesus, but with the whole city coming out to welcome their king. But most had better things to do. You remember the parable, don't you? I appreciate the invite, King, but hey, I just bought some ox and I gotta go check them out. Gotta break them in. Please have me excused. Hey, I wanna be there, King, but I just bought a piece of land. Gotta go check it out, survey it, mark it off. Maybe next time. I'm sorry, I couldn't show up because I just got married. It's not that the citizens of Jerusalem were busy. It's that they wanted nothing to do with this king. Thus Jesus says, if you had known, even you, you who had the scriptures, you who had the temple, you who had the history of what has happened, you who had eyewitnesses galore, if you had known, even you, Folks, the rest of the world was excused for not recognizing Jesus as the promised Messiah from sin, death, and the devil, but not them. They were not excused. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. What makes for peace is the Prince of Peace himself who is more than a delegate riding between two opposing forces seeking to make terms. 
The opposing forces are God and mankind, and mankind has been waging war with God and against God since the fall of Adam and Eve. This Prince of Peace is the peace offering by giving himself as a ransom, a substitutionary atonement for the sins of the world, and he, and not you, will absorb the full wrath of God. And so with no repentance on their part, no sorrow over their sin, no humility before God, no faith in the one whom God the Father promised since Genesis 3.15, Jesus gives an immediate judgment, followed by a future one. So as many times how we read the text, there is an immediate fulfillment of a prophecy, and then there is a future fulfillment of a prophecy. It's where the king now responds like a prophet, and he says the immediate judgment is, since you did not know the things that make for peace, they are now hidden from your eyes. I mean, how bad is that? That is like saying you couldn't see the truth if you had to. I won't let you see the truth. You won't see the truth even if you wanted to. And this hiddenness, this blindness, enables them to carry out the events of the crucifixion by week's end. But you know, even that could have been forgiven. It would have been forgiven. For, you, for you'll recall that after Jesus' resurrection and His ascension, Jesus sent Peter and the other apostles to preach repentance and the forgiveness of sin starting where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Holding out baptism as a gift, as a means of salvation. And the book of Acts records that some did believe, but that the vast majority, what? They didn't. Then Jesus gives them a future judgment. He says this, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children with you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because here it is again, you did not know the time of your salvation. Did Jesus want this? Did He want to see them destroyed? Of course not. As He's weeping, Matthew records Jesus saying, Jerusalem, old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And here's the line, but you were not willing. They simply didn't want a Savior like Jesus. So what's the consequence? Well, just like with the northern kingdom in 721, and just like in the southern kingdom in 586, Jerusalem would be annihilated, this time by the hands of the Romans. The historical record indicates the Romans besieged the city, exactly like Jesus says, building a wall around it where nothing went in and nothing came out. They besieged the city for six months. The glorious walls of Jerusalem were demolished, the city was burned, the temple was razed, and its inhabitants were slaughtered. All of which took place 40 years after Jesus said it. Imagine that. God still gave them 40 years of mercy to repent. And in 70 AD, God abandoned the city for good. You know, if you go to Israel today, you'll be taken to the Temple Mount. And there at the Temple Mount, just off the walls where you see the Western Wall, they call it the Wailing Wall, but that's kind of like a, that's kind of a, an insult. It's the Western Wall. Just on the other side of that Western Wall, you see this large, large stack of boulders. And right in the middle of it, just like this pulpit, there's a, there's a plaque. Uh, engraved, and it has this verse on it. 
where not one stone will be left unturned. It's a visual display that exactly what Jesus said would happen, what? It happened. Just like he said. The Romans took that edifice of that temple and they pried everything and they pushed it off the wall, leaving it right there where those stones are today. Gratefully, not all would reject Christ. Some would repent. Some would believe in Jesus. Some sooner, like those on the day of Pentecost. And some later with the Apostle Paul, who started out, as you know, as a persecutor of the church and of Christ. Yet when the fall of Jerusalem came, there was a remnant. The Lord never leaves Himself without a remnant. There was a small group of faithful believers. And when it came to those who would believe, what did Jesus do? He acted in His role as priest. He cleansed the temple area of all commerce, overturning tables and chairs, rebuking them, saying, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Listen, Jesus wasn't some rabbi coming into town along with other rabbis. This house was dedicated to Him. To the Lord. To Jehovah God. So He clears away all the man-made, non-religious obstacles, something He's done before, and now after the temple is now quiet again, Jesus sat down and He taught, teaching any still willing to listen in hopes that they would hear and believe. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of Christ. And here He is teaching. That is, before He, the Lamb of God, the prophet, the priest, and the king himself would be offered up on the cross for the sins of the world. Beloved, the demise of Jerusalem is a harbinger. It is a harbinger of the last day when the New Testament church, that which we know in our day, just like the Old Testament church before it, will be utterly destroyed. Why? Because God knows the false doctrine taught and celebrated and practically everywhere in His name. He sees the Roman Catholic Church, how His honor as the only mediator between God and man has been transferred to Mary and the saints. He sees that in most so-called mainline Protestant churches, His eternal truth has been traded in for the lies of social, social justice and environmental awareness. He sees the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, for the sake of Christ alone, is barely taught anywhere. He sees Christian worship denigrated into the worship of man, into secular concerts that focus on what people like to hear instead of the ministry of the soul-saving preaching of the gospel and the admin administration of the holy sacraments. Schisms rent asunder, as we just said. And sadly, he sees baptized Christians walking away from their baptism, deceived by the world and all of the treasures that it has to offer. Just like Jesus wept for Jerusalem then, He weeps today. And how much time has He ordained before, as we confessed, He comes to judge the living and the dead? Your guess is as good as mine. But destruction is imminent, despite all the calls for repentance. And most of the world's population will remain unbelieving and will perish. Yet even as we approach that time, Jesus still cares for the remnant. For Jesus comes into His temple, that being wherever His gospel is preached and wherever the sacraments are rightly administered, and through the ministry of the Spirit, He drives out the things that don't belong here. And then fills His temple with the preaching of the truth, with His Word, 
which is why when you hear his word read and then preached, what do you conclude? Or how do we conclude? That what you just heard is the peace that passes all understanding. The liturgy then bids you to lift up your hearts, to dismiss your earthly thoughts, to banish wicked daydreams for just a few moments. And then right before you're given the body and blood of the crucified and risen Lord, the antidote to sin, death, and the devil, the pastor holds the body and blood of the Lord Jesus in front of you and says, the peace of the Lord be with you always. God is visiting you right now with grace and mercy and forgiveness. So that when he visits later with justice and judgment, Praise be to God, you are safe. Because you are the remnant. And these are what make for peace. So to conclude this difficult text, always make certain that you are a part of the remnant, part of the true church that escapes the ruin and remains forever in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven with Christ when He returns in glory. And so, may the King's tears for earthly Jerusalem cause you to see just how earnestly He wants you to be found in that new Jerusalem that will last forever. In the holy name of Jesus, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.